So thank you for coming, everybody, and welcome. Welcome to those of you who have braved train strikes, school strikes, university strikes, fever there. Thank you also to all of those joining us online. Um, I hope that you can hear me okay. I imagine if you can't, I'll, I'll soon get a message. Um, but we're going to try and make the most of the technology we have available so that those of you speaking, presenting online and asking questions online feel like you're in the room with us. Um, and just as a reminder, uh, there'll be opportunities to speak throughout the day. If you're in the room, please raise your hand. If you're online, please raise your, your virtual hand. And uh, my colleague Morgan will be monitoring, um, monitoring that to make sure that you get to, to speak when, when you want to. Um, and I'm particularly pleased to be joined by our keynote speaker for the first session, who is Watan Ban, who I will be handing over to you in just a moment. Um, but before that, I want to say a few words about who we are and why we're here. And I should probably say who I am too. I realize I've not done that yet. So yes, that's me <laughs> on the screen. So I'm going to be our interim director of the Human Substance Group at IID. And um, over the past 12 months, um, IID urban researchers have been having a better cities year. And for those of you um, in the room, there's a, a, a paper on the tables, which I would like to have. I'll my husband one. Thank you so much. <laughs> this paper, which we brought out um, in time for the World Urban Forum last year, and it's also available online, full time, as better systems are possible, responding to the twin crises of climate change and inequality. And in this, we set out a series of propositions for better cities on the four themes that we'll be talking about today. So resilience, climate justice, housing justice, and water migration. And we're looking at these in the context of the climate emergency and growing inequalities. So today we've invited a range of partners and collaborators to interrogate those themes with us, with a view to helping us identify new avenues for research, collaborations, and joint policy impact. And it's an exciting moment to be doing this in IID. We have a new executive director. Tom Mitchell, who's here with me, and who's also battled trade issues to be here, and he'll be saying a few words in, in a moment after that. And you will all be seeing some very new and innovative work coming out of IID in the near future. But one of the reasons that we're having this event is that actually many of the urban researchers in IID are relatively new and bringing new ideas, collaborations, and partnerships with them into the Institute. And that's what we want to share with you today. But while there's change afoot, there is also continuity. IID has been doing urban research since the 1970s, and we have a large network of partners in cities in the majority world, including federations of urban grassroots groups, social movements, and civil society organizations. And we'll be hearing today from several of those, and many, um, some of them are even in the room with us, which is, which is fantastic. Um, and because of the way IID is run and funded, we can maintain those relationships outside of the project cycle. And these long-term collaborations can often be the starting point for new research. Um, and that research, what runs through it is this aim to bring out cha about change at the city level, but also to engage with policymakers at national or even international levels using the evidence that we've jointly generated. So IID has been home over the years to a very diverse group of urban researchers with different experience, different focus. But there are some things that unite us and unite that work over the de decades. And one of those is our commitment to partnering with grassroots groups and opening up spaces for marginalised uh, communities to influence policy processes and academic debate, and to join in increase our understanding of urban systems. So in particular, what I think marks us out is the way that we work with our partners to understand how low-income groups navigate the formality of the city, so within housing, basic service provision, and labour. And our research and advocacy work is underpinned by recognition of the fact that we need to work with informality rather than be part of vain attempts to stamp it out. And another constant in our work is the journal, Environment and Urbanization, which, while it's published by SAGE, is hosted by IID. And the current editor, Diana Mitlin, who I'm afraid couldn't raise the train, she could have got stuck on the way from Manchester, so she didn't, she didn't try and join some person, but um, she will be with us throughout the day, and she's also going to close the day for us. Diana is an IID associate and also a former member of staff. So EMU was founded in 1989, and it's an incredible story. Um, and there is someone who is also a uh, constant IID, David Satterfraid, who routinely describes it as the world's best journal. And he may be a little bit biased, having been one of its uh, founder, founding editors, but its stats really are pretty remarkable. Um, and from the start, the journals had a commitment to ensuring that most papers would be written by authors from the Global South. 
and as a way of encouraging submissions from people working, practitioners and academics in those parts of the world, um, submissions have always been accepted in Spanish, Portuguese and French as well as in English. There's been a commitment to gender balance among authors and to giving detailed coverage of the work of grassroots organisations. So there are some stats we have for 2021. I'm not sure we can put the stats in for 2022, and they're really quite remarkable. Um, ENU was ranked 38th out of 75 urban studies journals and 49th out of 169 environmental studies journal. And the impact factor for those of you in the room that care about those things um, is 4.066, and it's steadily increased over the past five years. Um, but most significantly, I think, there were more than 650,000 full text downloads in 2021. And the journal was cited nearly 3,000 times. And I think um, those of you in the room who, uh, virtual and real room, who was, have studied um, urban development and poverty um, in, over the past, you know, in your lives, you would have used in, I'm sure you will recognize it as a place you go to to find evidence, case studies, understand what's happening at, um, in cities around the world. And we're really proud of this history. And so why I'm stressing the newness and vitality of our group of urban researchers, um, as will become clear in the course of the presentation today, a lot of our work is building on themes that have been explored in, in previous issues of the ENU. And we are going to be looking today to the future of the ENU as well. The two issues that will come out in 2024 will be informed by two large projects that we're working on on at IMU. And one further thing to think about today is how future issues of ENU could help to move on debates within urban studies and policy making. And perhaps how some of you would like to contribute to that. So I'm now going to finish and hand over to our keynote speaker, Gautam Ban, um, who I hope will appear on the screen um, behind me. So Gautam is an urbanist whose work focuses on urban poverty, inequality, social protection and housing. And he is currently Associate Dean at the School of Human Development at the Indian Institute for Human Settlements in Bengaluru, India. He's also Senior Lead of Academics and Research there. Sorry. <laughs> And his previous research has focused on evictions, citizenship, and inequality in Delhi. And the IIHS, he has continued to work on questions of access to affordable and access. His new work engages with regimes of urban welfare and social security, including work on urban, urban health. Um, Gotham is also working with IID. Um, we're funding from the COVID Collective, uh, looking at how civil society used existing social protection mechanisms in India during COVID and documenting lessons from that. And he is, of course, an author in ENU, and I did a quick search on him, and he has articles in 2009, 2013, and 2014 on evictions, urban citizenship, and urban fantasy, and his most recent article in 2019 on southern urban practice. So, Gautam, um, um, the floor is yours, and you have around 15 minutes. Yeah, perfect. Uh, can you guys hear me all right in the room? Yeah, so uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, uh, I think it's it, you'll all see we're having a little a love fest for ENU in the chat, uh, which I think is always welcome uh, and never enough. And uh, just to say that I, I will go straight into some comments um, and keep to my 15 minutes, but I'm very sorry not to be able to join you in person, uh, but it sounds like a really fantastic day. So I was thinking about what would be useful for me to do um, in these opening remarks for a day like today, where we are opening into interactive discussions. And I thought what I'd do is lay out some new thinking that I'm being able to do with a set of colleagues, um, Edgar Peterser from the African Center for Cities, Sue Parnell from both UCT as well as uh, the University of Bristol, and Michael Keith, who's at Oxford. And Sorry, I think we may just need to ask a couple of folks on Zoom to mute. Uh, um, yes. Yeah, so. Uh, so the four of us have been talking for some time on thinking about um, what happens between why some of the things we all seem to know don't find their feet on the ground. Um, what happens when we have been saying in this community some of our arguments for a number of years, right? Um, and what happens in the ways in which we could take this moment or any moment to rethink the relationship between knowledge and different forms of practice? 
And that's really what I'm going to talk about a little bit in the remarks today, hoping it will give us some language for the rest of the day, which is to reopen that old Pandora's box. What's the hyphen in theory hyphen practice? Um, what's the way in which different forms of knowledge come from practice, relate to practice? How do we, because I think that's the spirit of IID's relationship to knowledge in the world, which is not just to produce it for its own sake, but to wield knowledge to impact certain forms of practice, to wield knowledge in the world, um, to think about what it means to be researchers in the world, not just researchers of the world. So this relationship between knowledge and different forms of practice is what I'm broadly talking about. And I want to do it through a particular offering to the gathering today, which is to think of what the four of us are calling the need for a new urban disposition. Um, and I'll sit with this word for a second, right? A disposition. Uh, I'm not talking today about a concept or a framework or a theory or a new understanding of either Southern urban theory or planetary urbanization or something in the middle. My, my comments are not about new frameworks or theoretical arguments. It is about something called a disposition. And I, I'm very drawn to this idea of disposition because it seems to hold a number of moving parts together very well. It's in some way an instinct. It's a sensibility um, about thinking about why we produce knowledge and why that knowledge has certain lives uh, in the world. It is very much so a sensibility or orientation. So it begins to sort of sneak into the territory of a belief system or an ideological position. Um, it also implies that all of us as researchers and institutions, but also individuals, we do what we do for a reason. We value it for different reasons. We want certain things to happen because we do the work we do. So we are disposed towards certain forms of knowledge. We are disposed towards certain forms of wanting to see certain kinds of impact. We may not like impact factors, but we would be lying to ourselves if we didn't all have some version of impact in our minds. We want our knowledge to have some evidence, some, leave some traces, leave footprints in the sand uh, in some ways. So I want to think of this idea of an urban disposition um, and try and describe it or try and say that at different political and historical conjunctures, it's always useful to come back and say, what's a good urban disposition for our favorite phrase, for these times, uh, in these times, in this historical political conjuncture? in our locations, in these relative geographies of North and South? What are the ways in which we should be approaching the city or the urban question? Um, to be, What kind of question should we be asking? What should be our value orientation, our balance between empathy and rigor, our takes between objectivity and subjectivity, our notions of evidence versus our instincts, um, questions of ethics and politics, questions of complexity and intended and unintended consequences, uh, knowing, um, you know, like Malik Simon often says, the city is precisely that that slips outside the edge of your last definition of it, right? To think about this constant endeavor at holding something that by definition we shouldn't be able to hold, but we must attempt to hold in some ways, right? So thinking about this urban disposition, and I'm looking at the four thematics for today, right? Disruptive resilience, housing justice, urban climate justice, and forced displacement. To me, the four of these already suggest a disposition. And I think that's a very good thing. It suggests certain parts of a disposition. So I want to offer us three parts of any disposition that slightly separate the work and type of knowledge that you produce when you levy or deploy a disposition into the production of knowledge. And I'm going to call these by three names. The first is that every disposition has to have a normative location. And I'll talk a little bit about what I mean by that. Mm -hmm. The second is that an urban disposition or any disposition must have an analytical dimension, which I think is distinct from a normative dimension, but very closely related to it. And the third is to think about a type of knowledge a disposition produces that we are calling operational. And it's this triad that I think make a disposition hold across the sum of its parts 
and is able to get out of some of the more familiar binaries of, of theory and practice and the relationship between the two. So the normative, the analytical, and the operational. And what I wanted to suggest in these opening remarks is that this is a useful framework to ask within each of our thematics. So for example, if you think of housing justice, in a way, its normative locations are apparent. It is a normative claim, right? The in analytical part of housing justice asks a different set of questions, not just what our values about justice are, but the ways in which we diagnose the problems currently, what injustice is, the forms of justice, the way in which justice is denied or delayed or deferred, the more sort of propositive, more utopic imaginations of what justice could look like. And the third part, which is the operational part of the disposition, changes the questions and say, say we have normative agreement, say we have analytical clarity, there is still the question of what do we need to know to order to actually deliver these questions and understandings of housing justice to actual people, right? So if you take the idea of rights, for example, there is a normative dimension to what rights are, why we care about them, what they hold, what they give to us as persons and citizens. There is an analytical question about the different types of rights, um, the distinction between, for example, first and second and third generation rights, the distinction between negative rights that protect civil liberties versus positive rights that have to deliver socioeconomic entitlements like housing and education. But even if, for example, you have normative agreement on the right to housing, you have an analytic clarity on what that right to housing could look like and what that right entails and what that entitlement at the end of the right that actual housing looks like, there is still the question of how do you deliver it? And the operational questions pulls us in a to require very different knowledge. For example, if housing can be given universally as a right, we all know that all of it cannot be delivered to all people simultaneously. So the operational question is, what is phasing? What is the incremental delivery of housing look like under a right to housing? What does that do to its analytical clarity as a right? What forms of housing can be delivered? And are they, for example, trade-offs between delivering certain rights in expense of others. A big debate in water systems is the choice to have better water 24 seven to 50% of your population or fragmented water supply for 45 minutes a day, but to 80% of your population. Now there are normative questions here, there are analytical questions here, and there are operational questions here. I think too often what happens is that the that in our debates, we often confuse these debates with each other, where actually we are in normative agreement, but we analytically do not agree, which means we diagnose the root of the problem differently at a different scale. Some of us call it structural, some of us call it more localized. We may not agree, we may agree normatively and analytically, but not agree on the best way to deliver it. So we may have differences between the right to housing delivered through a direct benefit cash transfer system in an open rental housing market versus the direct ownership and construction of public rental housing units. Whereas while motivated similarly with normative and analytical origins, our operational knowledge differs from each other. I think that it is worth our time to be able to both approach this then in two ways. One of them is to say, we need to produce slightly different forms of knowledge as researchers, as scholars, as practitioners, as activists, to clarify the normative element of our disposition from the analytical and the operation. We also need to take seriously that these different parts of our disposition tell us different things about the problems we're trying to solve. And very often we are not specific enough about whether we lack analytical clarity or operational detailing, whether we lack normative agreement or, or we lack analytical coherence. And I think that this muddling often creates a certain kind of complexity, which is distinct from the actual complexity of the problem. It's anyways complex, but our modes of knowledge production create a second layer of complexity that I feel, or we argue, or that we hope, a slightly different disposition towards knowledge could help us clarify. So I'll say a little bit about each of these types of things, and I'll just stop there, because I think that's kind of the language I want to leave. When I think about the normative, what do I mean? 
I want to distinguish the normative from the ideological. And this is an important rhetorical and epistemological move for me. This is not a diss against ideological positions at all. I don't think that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that my interest is not in, and my personal interest is in a disposition that makes its normative starting points apparent. It makes them transparent. It owns them. My interest in the normative is not to argue about what the right normative location is. I don't, I believe that is an impossible epistemological exercise. But what I think we don't have enough in our in, in the world of knowledge that we are in, we don't have enough clarity on why different institutions that argue for different positions, different researchers that argue for different practices, what are the normative locations that began their knowledge production exercise? I feel like a lot of why we argue certain things is because of those normative locations, right? You may begin in thinking about housing justice, where for you, the notion of housing as a public good and a basic need and a human right is an unquestioned normative location. And that is important because when you start with certain normative locations, you are willing to live with certain trade-offs in other aspects that necessarily may come. What I mean by that is a long debate, for example, in India between questions of class and caste. The idea that one would live with certain forms of identity-based inequality to further economic inequality, because one believed that economic inequality would also have social and material effects, probably does. The counter argument is that one believes that social transformation must precede economic transformation because the, that, that one is not willing to tolerate social inequality in the name of economic equity. One can think of these as priorities. One can think of these as entry points. I'm calling them part of the normative aspect of our definition. I think normative locations are really important precisely in order, and I leave it at this, to make the trade-offs we are willing to make in our arguments apparent. I think when, for example, questions of disruptive resilience and housing justice fall upon the same settlement on the banks of a river in the city of Delhi, and claims to the environment and claims to survival and claims to housing all simultaneously land at the same time, and the trade-offs between environment and development we don't want, one can hope analytically to refuse those trade-offs, but there are calls here about the fact that people and researchers are willing to make certain trade-offs, accept certain inequalities in order to have equality in the variable they care the most about. Amartya Sen described this as a sense of basal equality. And his argument was that all of us have a primary ethical and normative location and we will tolerate inequalities in other aspects of our systems as long as there is more equity and progress in the variable we care the most about. And some of the debates um, between, uh, like I was saying in India, between social and economic or the material and the social have been on these lines. In the analytical, I think the challenge is different. In the analytical, we are arguing that some of the core work that needs to be done needs to be to find ways of seeing and understanding and describing cities that more consciously fights against the limits of our methods, our disciplinary canons, and our current canonical vocabularies. There's two kinds of plays here. One is the more familiar challenge of theory from the South that says that certain universal conceptual paradigms have traveled placelessly um, and have come to be the language against we either compete or position ourselves. We are not yet modern enough. We are not yet um, you know, uh, industrialized enough. We are not yet developed enough. These unspoken paradigms against which we measure ourselves or that it's vocabulary that does not emerge from our location. This is one kind of disconnect. The other kind of disconnect is precisely the fact that if you argue between urban climate justice, housing justice, and, and disruptive resilience, and we take a single analytical concept, the idea of value and the idea of valuation, the fact that value and valuation are so radically differently understood between economists, environmental economists, ecologists, housing rights activists, sociologists, and governors and mayors is an area of analytical contestation that a disposition must take on. I think that what a lot of the division between discipline, sector, profession, and vocabulary and methods have done to us 
is that they have made sure that our ways of analyzing complex urban problems, despite all our efforts, has remained fragmented and splintered in very particular ways. It's not just a question of multiplicity and plurality. It's not just many disciplines with different methods. That's certainly part of it. But the added layer of the fact, which say the ENU journal has tried so hard to push against, is that those different methods and disciplines and canons have very different access to being declared authoritative or powerful knowledge. Certain concepts, certain paradigms, certain disciplines have an absolute political economic advantage in the way they travel and in the way they shape our understandings. Um, so both in terms of the north-south divide or in terms of the discipline divide or in terms of the theory practice divide, the analytical part of the disposition, the work I feel we need to do here is we need to do much more to fight against the fragmented ways in which knowledge about the urban is still being produced, though we've become such a long way in the last 15 years. But we have to ask two clear questions about this. One is about the methodological limits of interdisciplinary work and what it takes institutionally in terms of teams, in terms of co-production, um, in working and seeing differently, because we may want to be interdisciplinary, but we have real limits as researchers. And the other is about taking seriously the political economy of knowledge production and why that creates silos that could be intellectually broken, but are institutionally protected. And I think those are two different senses of the word. But to me, the analytical part of our dispossession still says, how are we, when we describe, say, housing justice, what is the problem we think we need an answer to? How are we framing the problem itself? Where does our analytical understanding of housing injustice come from to which housing justice is the answer, right? So ways of framing the problem, ways of framing the question, ways of orienting ourselves. And obviously this location requires us to be apparent about our normative intentions, not just our epistemological and methodological rigor. And the last part then is a question of the operational. Here, I think, there are many ways in which there is, in my, in my sense of, the, of a lot of urban knowledge today, I still feel as a reader um, a certain hunger for there not being enough knowledge. Um, I remember reading an article by Philip Harrison, the South African academic who left the university um, to become Johannesburg's head planner and wrote a paper on what he read as a planner saying that he found that a lot of knowledge that he read did not give him enough to inform him for his everyday practice as planner. It did not help him think through what he had to do at work every Monday to Friday, navigate trade-offs, think of operational design questions, think of delivery mechanisms. I have felt this very intimately in the last two years during COVID, and a lot of our recent work has been on this, because in COVID, I found myself part of a government of Delhi effort at large-scale food relief faced with very clear challenges of, of a government that was normatively aligned, that wanted to give large scale relief and welfare, that was analytically clear that the gaps were particular and we weren't reaching particular types of settlements, particular types of workers and particular types of people, and yet operationally could not find paradigms to move quickly enough because we did not know how to find workers that were not on databases because they were working without contract and outside the state's reach. We could not find ways to think about how to mobilize gaps in our information. We could not find what databases to use as a proxy for the missing databases of informal workers and in informal settlements we did not have. We did not know whether or not a digital app-based QR code would be deeply exclusionary or inclusionary because we were stuck with physical lockdown restrictions that prevented any other way of reaching scale. All of these questions are deeply operational. They are about the delivery mechanisms of social protection, distinct from the normative questions of what social protection should be, distinct from the analytical question of how informal urbanization changes the logics of social protection itself, distinct a focus on questions of delivery, of trade-offs, of institutional design, of accounting, of audit, and of finance. So my suggestion in closing then is to illustrate how the way the questions we ask of something like social protection or housing justice change when we ask the normative, the analytical, and the operational. And I think it's imperative for us that not individually, but collectively, in the knowledge we produce together as scholars, academics, researchers, and institutions, 
we find someone picking up one of these three elements, or we talk to the other two elements, even if we focus on one. My suggestion is not a kind of complete knowledge enterprise where everyone has to go through all three. I don't think that'd be humanly possible, but I think we need to know that all three elements are in play and they require different forms of knowledge. They require that knowledge to be differently wielded in different institutions, contexts, histories, and political economies. But if we are able to hold them all together, then I hope is that this disposition will be able to find a collective set of people who can both offer us new knowledge, but also immediately be part of wielding that knowledge into the world, into practices, and then come back and close the loop again. Uh, and I hope that these three terms and this idea of this disposition could be useful in the discussion that are to follow in the day. And that's my time. And so I'll stop. Thank you. Well, Dan, you probably couldn't hear us giving you a round of applause, but hopefully you can uh, see us. Um, I think you've got a lot to think about for this day, but also actually a lot for IIT to think about, um, because we're going through a process of change right now. And I think um, Tom will probably speak a bit about, about that now. Um, and certainly I think we're thinking about being clear of our normative intentions. We have we've probably danced around those three dimensions in the past, and I think being clear about what it is we want to achieve and how we're going to get there is is key to the future of IID. So I'm going to hand over to Tom now. Tom has on IID, I think six months ago. Yeah. Um, and I guess you've passed your probation. <laughs> but he's come to IID from Franklin, uh, where he spent several years as Chief Strategy Officer, officer shaping an agenda on transformative innovation. And prior to that, he led the Climate and Environment Program at ODI, which he's Institute. He's also supported UN policy on disaster reduction and served as coordinating lead author of the IPCC Special Report on Extreme Weather. Um, and uh, Tom has published widely on climate resilience, but not, I don't think, in ENU as yet. I did, didn't do an exhaustive search, so maybe you have at some point published the journal, but that can always be of course be done again. So, close your I'm just thinking about that now, that's a good point. I looked at my publications the other day, and half of them I don't even remember, so who knows. Um, it's a pleasure to be here, thank you. And I think the, uh, the comments that I will make flow beautifully, actually, and rather um, serendipitously from the ones that Gotham was making. So, uh, uh, and, and I'll come at this as well as saying that I'm, I'm not a nervous, so be, be kind uh, to me. Um, what, I, what I am keen to do is to maximize the impact of IID and ideally the impact of IID and its partnerships at a time where I think we're under real threat, you know, the crises, the multiple crises that we're facing as humanity and, and as um, as uh, people and planet are so severe that we need to act. And IID has, as we've heard, 50 years of, of work on, um, on urban issues. And I genuinely believe it's now time to place the chips on the table. It's to say, what are we going to do with that 50 years of knowledge, development, connections, partnerships, rich understanding, in a way where we really can hopefully make an operational difference. And I think that's where this framing of, of the three um, three dimensions, the three dispositions that Gotham has highlighted is valuable for us. But for me, I genuinely think that the kind of fight against climate change and biodiversity loss and inequality will be won or lost in our cities. And I think that raises the stakes. And I think we've all heard this, you know, I'm not going to to, to talk through all of the different arguments around that. We've heard it many, many times. But it was striking to me. I was in um, I was in Delhi with Aditya last week or the week before. I'm losing track of time now. But the sense that really, in terms of the growth of urban settlements and the physical location of urban settlements, we're going to be adding scores more Delhis to the world uh, over the next 20 or 30 years. And it's kind of frightening to think that that level of of, of building of infrastructure, of kind of inhabiting of the planet and so on is going on. But of course, it's not just about mega cities whatsoever. It's about an urban landscape where we've heard, you know, most recently one of IIED's blogs highlighting the fact that the fastest growth is coming often from cities that few people have ever heard of. And so what does it mean then to be working with a landscape of, of urban planners and leaders where that sense is radically changing and equally people are coming new into the really difficult systemic challenges that city face, cities face when they're dealing with the climate crisis, biodiversity and, and inequality challenges. I think 
for me also, there is a sense that um, cities are being dealt a really tough hand. They're being challenged to think about a net zero future, one where emissions are at very least cancelled out by other forms of um, uh, sequestration. They're needing to be resilient in the face of extremely challenging impacts of climate change. They're needing to tackle really profound inequalities, looking at issues of justice, and often they're needing to deal with very fast inflows of people. I was in uh, Bangladesh as well in, in the trip that I had and, and learned that in Dakar, there were 2,000 people arriving every day into the city. And to think that uh, leaders within the urban space have to juggle these uh, this landscape on a daily basis and think to the future is a really significant challenge. And so therefore, my question is what types of knowledge and ideas and support do those people in charge of changing those cities and leading those cities need now? And what is it that IIED and this rich network of partners and 50 years of knowledge can, can do now to support them? And I think what Gotta was talking about of that operational practical knowledge is something that IIED is tending to pride itself on. But my question would be, have we gone far enough to talk about and to deal with some of those really hardcore operational challenges, and particularly also in the context of, of new and intersecting and systemic and cascading crises of risk? I think the um, other dimension for me, and I come into IIED, um, as, as Lucy said, from Climate Kick. Climate Kick, for those of you who don't know, is an agency that has worked predominantly in Europe about bringing innovations at a climate challenge. Mm -hmm. And equally, while we have focused in IIED on many cities in, in Africa and in Asia and in that urban landscape, I don't think we should uh, forget the fact that there are cities all around the planet that are being challenged in different ways. Now, maybe the balance of issues is slightly different, but actually the underlying component and some of the the dark matter that sit underneath the way a city works is very similar. And so I'm heartened to see the work that IAD has started to do to think about retrofit, for example, in, in places like London or across Europe, where we know that meeting the climate targets of Europe, retrofit rates need to be at least six times faster than they are now. Um, or we've got a situation where actually many of the materials that we use within our construction industry are hugely climate damaging, and yet we're not changing them anywhere near fast enough. I saw a statistic the other day that 90% of our construction methods and our construction materials haven't changed since the Victorian times. And so we've got a situation of, of bad concrete. We've got materials that are causing us huge challenges. We've got construction zones that are creating emissions, and we've got people being forcibly displaced because of retrofit that in somehow supports the richer parts of the community. So there's a lot that can be done, I think, in starting to join hands across places and try to understand what it is that we can share from south to north, from east to west, from north to south, and so on. This is now about a partnership for me of, of, of a practical, insightful knowledge about what can we do now to tackle some of those pressing challenges. Couple of other points. I think um, for me, IIED was set up back in the early 70s to uh, understand that environment and development were fundamentally interlinked. And also based on a concern that our development pathway was placing environmental uh, aspects at risk. And so that, I think, is this organization's mission and using knowledge and insight and evidence and engagement in policy, influence and so on, to make sure that the environmental dimension isn't being put at risk. Now, can we hand on heart say we've succeeded in that? I'm not sure we have. We're on a pathway where there's so many externalities of the environment because of our development and economic system that actually I think IIED has a responsibility and a duty now to take its assets and say, right, what are we going to do? Put ourselves in a position of vulnerability and humility, but say, actually, it's now time to work differently, to acknowledge that we've not cut through in the way that we wanted. And I think some of that is about stepping into a space of operational knowledge, of moving from being urban researchers to being 
urban policy entrepreneurs, urban housing activists, uh, uh, campaigners, politically engaged at times, make, you know, step into a space that may be uncomfortable for those who've worked in urban research, but to do so now in a way where that is our responsibility, but actually take the knowledge and the insight over that period and say, look, we're going to do our best here in building on what we know, understanding contexts and, and the normative components and the analytical components that were highlighted and say, right, we are going to be here now to support that operational dimension. And so for me, IAED, over the next period, as we define our new strategy and do so hopefully with, with many of you and in partnership with many of you, is to say, well, what are those big ideas then? that we can ally around that may have a chance of making a significant difference. Where they are clear, they're simple, they're bold, they're ways where we can reach tens of millions of people and that we can start to really lace in that operational knowledge in such a way where we can adjust and learn to go. And I think if we're not allying behind those big bold ideas, propositions, those scalable propositions, then we're now not doing our job. And so I suppose my question to you and to and to myself is what are those brave ideas? Now we've heard just as picking up the three theme of housing justice. For me, it's not just about housing justice now, it's about a, resign, a right to a net zero, resilient, working, engaged, uh, working and, um, and supportive uh, home and environment. That's more than just a right to a roof over your head. Could it be about adaptive social protection? We've heard about the importance of social protection and getting cash and resources to, to where it's needed, but can we make that anticipatory, much more scalable? Could it be about the fact that we now need to build with nature? Let's get away from man-made materials and go back to building with nature in such a way where we have forgotten some of the lessons that we've had of the past, where many of our indigenous people in local communities know what it means to work more closely with nature. Again, I was in Delhi and I was looking across the city and looking at the number of dark roofs that there are in a city that suffers 50 plus degree heat. A very simple measure, we can get some white paint out. And, you know, and my point being is that there are practical, clear, bold solutions, ideas, propositions that we now need to work with that can cut through, but only if we're supporting that with the depth of knowledge and understanding that we can bring to it. Last point I want to make, and then I'll close, is that we know that there is uh, urban systems. We know urban systems are complex. We know that pulling at any one thread like a bowl of spaghetti, you can't fully understand what's gonna happen when you work on one particular thread. I now think we need to work in a much more systemic, joined up portfolio approach. And here I mean where we may want to put a bold proposition on the table. Who else is putting bold propositions on the table? How do we think about that as a system of ideas and of levers of change that we can work together across usual and unusual partnerships, including potentially some of those that we previously held our hands up and said they're not our friends, to understand that actually that landscape of partnerships is one where we need to engage because urban systems are important and equally we need to understand and connect and learn together about what it takes to shift things with that kind of sense and learn and, and test approach. And so then this is not really about the human settlements group. It's not really about urban researchers. It's about layering in and knitting in a set of ideas across IID, across networks and systems of partnerships, and to begin to work together on those big ideas of which the urban environment is a place where probably there is the richest and most pressing and most dramatic landscape for action. And with that, I think I'll pause. Thank you, Lucy.